Okay, hello, welcome to episode 375 of the Self Help Podcast with me, Ed Lamb, my good pal Sean Orford. How are you doing, Sean? I'm stunning and amazing. How are you? All right, yeah. You feeling successful? You feeling good? I'm always good. Just um, sometimes I'm gooder than others. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, we're talking about success today and what it means and why, we, why it makes us do the, thing, the crazy things that we do. Um, yeah, and I saw an article online, so we'll, we'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, Livingthepresent.co.uk for all the show notes and links. Uh, yeah, do check it out and get in touch with us if there's anything you would like us to talk about. Um, and all the archived episodes are online as well, all 374 of them, called Blimey Governor. Uh, what have you been up to, Sean? How's life? Uh, life's good. We're, we're experimenting with, um, with food. There's a, a pizza place. Um, in Liverpool, mm -hmm. which uh, if you go over and get them, is providing you with pizzas that you take home and cook. Ooh. So they, they do all the dough and you, you can order what you want. And mm -hmm. then they give them to you. You can take them home, keep them in the fridge if you like, or just stick them in the oven and cook yeah. them. Which one is it? Um, I can't remember, remember its name. They were all talking, but we're all, we're all booked in to do this thing. So we're going to try this uh, in our bubble and yeah. have a, a pizza night um, but actually go over and get them raw and then cook them off in the oven which is a fascinating idea because um, it means you can add to adapt you can do all kinds of things with it um, yeah it's brilliant yeah we've yeah. been getting pizza pizza oven crazy really we got a little portable one for my wife's birthday a few months ago and, um, yeah yeah getting the hang of it actually it's quite an art form isn't it getting the getting the temperature right and ready to go and keeping that yeah. uh, it's, yeah. quite, it's quite a technique to it but also i discovered not getting it too hot because the food you put in it bursts into flames <laughs> if it's too hot i discovered well you've got a, you've got a bit more serious one than us i'm not sure uh i was just down to the left actually if you watch it on youtube i'm not sure you can just see it there, there you go. yeah brilliant um, yeah so uh, yeah. i'm not sure ours is capable of really 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 roasting away it gets hot enough to cook a pizza you know in a minute a minute and a half quite easily yeah um but well, yeah our, ours will, will go north of 500 degrees mm. when it's which get, is just ridiculous you I mean, madness that's some pretty yeah. serious heat i mean i think ours will get very close to that because that you can just yeah. Uh, yeah. You can't get within a foot of it uh the, the open door mm. and uh, mm. amazing yeah yeah um yeah well, let me know where, where it is and uh, which pizza place, because um, I'll be willing to give that a go. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting concept. And, and it, the thing that um, engages me about it is how different food places are trying different things to engage the public to maintain their business. And, yeah. and I like this idea, so I, I feel like I want to support them. Well, it's pizza. It. You know, if, if, there's, if there's no pizza going into the, the future that we're headed into, then it's not a world worth living in. There, there must be pizza, you know. <laughs> now, this could be a political party. It could be the pizza party. The pizza party. <laughs> free, free pizzas every Friday. <laughs> <laughs> now you're talking. Well, yeah, I mean, the government are throwing some money at Eat Out to help out and all that. And we took advantage of it last night. So we went to a restaurant for the first time indoors. Uh, actually, no, not quite, because we did go to a cafe when we were away a couple of weeks ago. Um, but this is our first proper meal out in a while and uh, it's kind of strange actually because the restaurant did everything right you know it was well it felt clean and safe and they were wiping down the menus and waiters were wearing masks and all that stuff but yeah we still did feel a little bit vulnerable whether it's just because we're not used to going out and being with that many people or I don't know I felt and like when, when, when you'd finished the meal were you, were you able to just kind of chill out or did they want you to get out so they could put someone else in or, you know, was there pressure on you? No, there was no pressure actually. It was, I think everyone had booked uh, that was in there and it was pretty full. Uh, we booked at six o'clock and we left about half seven and there was, oh, there was right. yeah, there was no pressure to go. Not, not that we felt anyway. So mm. yeah. it was cool, but yeah, it's, we're in that balancing act now, aren't we? Where, I mean, well, there's probably people listening to this thinking, you know, why do you go out and why do you put, why are you putting people at risk and all that stuff? And I can, I can understand that because we did feel a little bit when we first got there, like, oh, by me, you know, this, this is really busy. I'm not sure we should be here. But then there's the risks from the virus, aren't there, which are great. And then there's the risks from the like total economic collapse uh, and the, the job losses and 
uh, all that stuff. So it's going to be a bit of a weird balancing act in the, uh, in the coming I, I, I think that the, the kind of uh, the going and getting the raw pizzas is a, is a good kind of halfway move for me. Um, yeah. So we're actually going and participating. So we're actually enabling them to, um, to do what they need to do. I assume that cooking the pizza will kill um, any nasty germs and things that are in and around it, you know. Yeah, um, we'd hope 500 degrees sh yeah. should do it. I wonder if anyone's done any experiments yeah. on, the, on the virus to see if it can withstand that kind of heat. <laughs> yeah, 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 it'd be interesting, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're talking about success today and I guess being seen out in your local hotspot and your, in your local restaurant uh, is, is a little little mini part of being successful, whatever that might mean. So there's an article I, I was sent and I'll link to uh, in, in the show notes on theatlantic.com, why success won't make you happy. And it's a reasonably long but really entertaining read. Um, yeah, yeah, I've, I've got it up here. I've just been what success been is. looking at it. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, I've talked about this in the past, but what, what's success to you, Sean? Because you, you have a definition, don't you? Your own definition? Yeah, my, my, my definition of success is really simple. It's that if you go to bed with a smile on your face, feeling good about the day you've just had, and if you wake up with a smile on your face, feeling good about the day that you're going to have, then to me, you're a successful person. Because mm -hmm. success for me is about feeling happy and feeling contented and, and alive and being in your life in a positive way. The, the, and on the article that you sent out here, um, the, the, the headline is success addicts choose being special over being happy, which is kind of something that we see a lot. But underneath the, the kind of subtext to that, he says, the pursuit of achievement distracts from the deeply ordinary activities and relationships that make life meaningful. And I think mm. that is a really profound statement because in our rush to be successful, whatever that is for us, we can just miss out on the ordinary things around us all the time. It's actually where happiness is. It's in the moment and what, where we are, what we do. Yeah. Well, so it, what, what, what's success for you? No, no. <laughs> you asked me that before. I haven't given that much, too much thought. I mean, in the debate, it's, I think it's a bit more complicated than, than, than your definition because there's, there's a quote in this article and it says, many scholars such as psychologist Barbara Killinger have shown that people willingly sacrifice their own well-being through overwork to keep getting hits of success what is success i ask so i think i think it's i think success is a bit deeper than yeah that sense of happiness and well-being because i guess that if you know human progress if you can call it that is kind of a necessary part of that progress seems to be sacrifice and um yeah, yeah I mean, hang on hang on it could be <laughs> that you that you do sacrifice things, but in that process of sacrificing, maybe through serving others, it makes you feel good. Yeah, and because one of the things which I think is a kind of a misnomer in the way that we look at people is that when somebody is a really nice person and they're always looking after everybody, and it's like, wow, they're just so nice. People do it because they get something from it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and if it didn't make them feel good, they wouldn't do it. Even the person who's the most miserable moaning, I have to suffer all the time, it, do it because they get something from it. All behavior is reward driven. People do things because they get something out of it. You know? Yeah. I mean, yeah, if you look at someone. Well, if you look at someone who does like, achieve something which is physically hard to do, like a marathon. Or you know, climbing some some mountain, you know, and you can see from their fingers and their hands and their feet that the scars and the blisters. Uh, you can still so you can you can achieve things and derive happiness from them, even that even if they are if they hurt you if they you know if they if you lose a finger because of it that kind of thing. So I guess we we'll come back we we'll come to that word happy, which is a word that I I'm, I can't really compute in some ways because people assume that happiness equals a smile on someone's face although i'm sure you know people that have smiles on their faces who are underneath struggling big time so but but it, it, if you think about that concept of reward um maybe i mean someone who self-harms and cuts say 
they build up a level of emotional tension, which is also chemical in their brain, to the point where they need to cut. And when they cut, the brain releases endorphins that make them feel good. And so there's a reward in the behavior. That's why they do it. Now, would, would, you, would we say that someone who is good at cutting themselves is successful because their brain's full of successful chemistry? Wow. Yeah. And it's one of those things that is very much like success is in the eye of the beholder. It's a bit like mindfulness. Mindfulness makes you good at doing things. So if you're a mindful surgeon, then you get much better at the process that you're going through. Um, what about if you're a mindful assassin? Does that make you better at killing people? Mm. You know I mean? it, it, all these things about how, how do we view them? You know? I mean, success for me is people that feel good. And, and I, if you go to places like Mumbai, where there's people that have got absolutely nothing um, relative to ourselves, that can be the happiest people you ever come across. Yeah. You know? uh, and I know people here who are laden with riches and wealth, and they're the most miserable buggers on the planet. And they're miserable moaning people but we would see them as successful they got the house and they go on the holidays and they got the car and the yachts and you know miserable buggers mm -hmm. well, yeah that's not success to me that's not well that comes on nicely to a, another quote in this article which william james once noted we are not only gregarious animals liking to be in sight of our fellows but we have an innate propensity to get ourselves noticed and noticed favorably by our kind so yeah, I mean, we were, I was walking to the restaurant last night with my wife um, and, you know, checking out people's, the front of their houses and their driveways and the front gardens and, you know, noticing the difference between the ones that are, well, currently under the construction, uh, which are, are quite a few and kind of being reshaped uh, and the ones that haven't had much TLC in a while to the ones that are, you know, Im absolutely immaculate and kept uh, just like combed to within an inch of their life. And it's only this morning, you know, since we've come on to do this episode that I've started to analyze how I perceived those different driveways and the people that live behind the doors. Um, so, yeah, how can we, yeah, what is it that makes us want to be kind of appreciated by our fellow human beings or noticed? But it, it, every group is different, isn't it? It's like it, if I need to be noticed by having a certain kind of haircut or a certain you know, pair of trainers or whatever, those are the things that give me the trappings of success. One that you, know, you just talked about the cleanliness thing. When we drive to Italy, we go around Lake Lugano. Now, if you go into the town of Lugano, which is on the Swiss side, um, someone's hoovered the streets. I mean, it's so pristinely clean, it's amazing. You drive down the lake and you go over the border into Italy, and it's like, <laughs> you know, it's a completely different attitude. Now, I'm, I'm not sure whether uh, the Italians, what, what's that wonderful phrase that I can never remember about the art of doing nothing, the sweet art of doing nothing that the Italians have? You know, it, it's, I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. Now, is it to them that to be successful is to be relaxed and be able to promenade by the lake and that's fine? But if you're over in Lugano town, does that mean that you have to be out there sweeping the street to be successful? Mm. Yeah? It, it's how we view it, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're you're not into cars but there are lots of people um, one, one of the the guys in one of the factories that i cover has just got himself a tesla mm -hmm. um, and uh, it does 300 miles on charge and and he's over the moon he just loves it it's amazing best mm -hmm. car he's ever had yeah sure. yeah yeah does does that represent success being able to buy a tesla i don't know at the moment it probably does yeah you know i think yeah there's a lot about car culture and i, I do want to see it, the, the downfall of the car industry you know i'm quite i'll be quite open about that but you know for all the technical stuff that i'm trying to do in terms of get a bit more space on the road for people to walk and to cycle safely uh the the kind of emotional connection that we have with our vehicles uh which you know i've been i've had many a time with the cars that i've owned and driven um is, is, is astronomical you know I can't get near that it's just it's, it's just it's insane to think about it that we can be so connected to a, a hunk of metal and rubber and, and plastic that sits on sits outside our house for or on our 
the car park where we work for most of its life. But we are we are really connected to these things, aren't we? But don't you think you get connected to everything? You know, it could be a particular lead that you use, <laughs> and and someone's got your lead, and it's like you feel bereft because you you know you need your lead, it's, and you you got another one, but it's not the same as this. Oh yeah, come. I always have I always have my morning coffee in this particular mug. We've got a, a cupboard full of like well thirty mugs probably. This is the only one I ever use. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Weird. But it, it, one of the things that always amazes me is that when someone's alive, um, they have all this stuff which is so meaningful to them. You know, half a burst balloon from their second birthday that they've always had in this drawer. You know, and it, and it, it's like this stuff is so important to them. As soon as they die, it just becomes someone's effects, and you get you get a skip in, and you take it down the tip. Yeah. You know, and it's like, what do we imbue on something else? You know, we, we give it value and quality. We do. And that's, that's success, isn't it? I mean, th think of all the religious icons, all the, you know, the different statues and things that people go and, and uh, to cry over and, and give food to and all that kind of stuff. And it's a piece of stone, but we imbue it with this, this special quality. We do, but we, I mean, I take it you don't take that, your special lead. When you you know when you're out at a meeting or you're out at a restaurant or you're with friends, you don't get your lead out your pocket and put it on the table. You know how you know how we take our phones out of our pockets and put it on the table sometimes, and it's almost. Mm. You know, I've, I've probably been guilty of this when I've had a new phone, which is very rare, of putting the phone on the table so people can you know people notice it. <laughs> so, and you know we do it with our cars, you know, with, with our Tesla. You know, you might park it in a place where a lot of people see it, or a Ferrari, or a Lamborghini. But would, would, would you put your car keys on the table so people go, "Oh, have you got a Tesla?" Possibly, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I've, I've got a Volvo, so I've, yeah, I've never had that feeling. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, I'm sure some people would go, "Wow, Volvo, good car." Oh, very safe, very yeah, practical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get that strength around you, solid. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, if you're driving a KA, it's more like a Chinese takeaway carton, isn't it? It's like it's not the same, is it? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, how do we what what do we see in the physical objects that we buy? Whether it be a car or a or a cable. In um, in psycho speak, we talk about love objects. Mm -hmm. So what tends to happen with people that have this drive to acquire possessions for success, to be appear to be successful is they will focus on something that they need to get. It could be a bit of furniture, it could be, you know, uh, some clothing, it could be a car, whatever. And they, they will spend time ruminating on it and building this drive and desire. So, you know, the, the person goes past the shop, looks in the window, sees the dress, think that's nice. And then they keep going past the shop and then they stop and they look. And then maybe they go in and they kind of touch it and feel it and, and then they go in and they try it on and in the end they buy it and they they built up this kind of emotional connection to the object they buy it and then they take it home and the drive to get it is gone yeah. because they the need to to have a love object will move on to something else so there are lots of people that maybe have dresses clothes whatever in the wardrobe they've never actually worn yeah um yeah. It's fascinating that, yeah, I mean, the business side behind it, the kind of the advertising and the development that goes into a product. Cars are, cars are interesting because yeah, they're expensive and Tesla are particularly interesting because, and, and, I, and I was obsessed with Tesla for a good long while um, because it wasn't enough for Tesla to make a car that was electric for a start and that could do whatever, 250, 300 miles on a charge. They, they were the basics that people uh, needed from an electric car at least. Tesla had to make a car and make cars that are better in every single way than uh, a regular petrol car. So not only, yeah, they, they go far enough on a charge, maybe not quite as far as some people would like to go, but let's say 300 miles is fine. Um, they had to be really desirable as well. And it's fair play to Elon Musk and his design team that they recognize that because cars are desirable objects, you know, so it's not enough just to be electric. It had to be the best car you could buy. Uh, and it kind of is really in, so in many ways, you know, it's, it's got the range, it's got the looks inside. It's like a spaceship with that big screen. It drives itself sort of to it. Well, to a point it's got cameras all around it and sensors and all this kind of stuff. I think the door can open as you approach 
you know, because it knows that you've got the key in your pocket or, or the card or, or your phone. Yeah. The door will open to greet you and all this kind of stuff. So they had to pack did, it. Did, 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 did you know that you have to name a Tesla? You have to give it a name? Yeah, on the screen, I did. Yeah, yeah and again, that, that's, that's probably a weird, clever marketing thing so that we we because a car essentially is just a tool isn't it for, for moving but it, it becomes a personality once you name it yeah, yeah. yeah. and, and so. the other thing it has weird things in it like you can set whoopee cushions for the seat yeah. so when people when people sit down it makes a farting noise and you can select it's got a whole kind of dictionary of farting noises that you can choose from yeah like kind of, very all, very strange very strange bit. yeah these are all things that amuse me in the past but now i'm just kind of like foaming at the mouth with in, in anger at all these clever little ways that car companies um, suck us into buying, spending three, four hundred pounds a month plus on something that doesn't even get used that much. You know, it's sat, it's sat doing nothing 95% of the time. <laughs> but, yeah. fair play. But it, 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 that whole issue about getting you to create a relationship with an object, isn't that what uh, people like Apple do? Yeah, they do. Exactly. It's exactly the same, actually, well, for a different kind of thing. You know, a phone is a, is a tool that allows you to communicate with, uh, with someone or a group of people or to read. But yeah. it's, it's a, much more than that. I wonder, there's probably people out there that hate phones as much as I hate cars. that are just rail, like, <laughs> railing against the system and like, ah, what are you doing? Spending a grand on, a, on a, an iPhone 11 or whatever it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. when, you could have just got this Nokia for 50 quid and it still does the job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but, it, it's, but is it that if you've got the Apple, you're more successful than if you've got the Nokia? Or is it that you're more um, awake to what's going on in the world? It, it, it's, it's a really weird thing. And that's what I mean about when you start to look at it. What, what about the success of status? You know, someone like Trumpy, who needs to be the president, and the headlines today on the news feed were about Trump is really scared he's not going to get re-elected. That was the headline. You know, that he's, he's scared, he's got this fear. Now, I, I don't know whether he has or he hasn't. But the, the, the issue about the need to be seen to have that title, to have that job, whether you're good at it or bad, that doesn't matter. When I was in the Middle East, it was so, so important for people to have a title. They needed to have a title as a manager, director, you know, a leader, whatever. Yeah. Um, and that was more important to them than doing the job because very often the person who had the title couldn't do the job anyway. Mm. Um, and they were rely relying on other people to do the jobs for them. But they needed to have the title to feel okay. I'm just, um, I'm just checking out some emails that I've got in my inbox from people that have message me and the, what their job titles are. So I won't give away the game or anything, but one of them I've had from recently from a, a fella, a company I work for, and his job title is executive assistant. So they're not, I know this person and he's, you know, top, top guy, uh, does a good job kind of getting people's diaries together. Uh, but his title is executive assistant. <laughs> so, uh, it's instead of just assistance or no title at all. Why do we even need a title in, in the first place? I guess there was. It's interesting that I, back in the sixties, I can remember in India there was a um, a, a guy who signed himself with his name, and then it said B A Calcutta brackets failed. Right, and it was important enough for him to indicate that he had been to university. The fact that he didn't get the qualification. Wow. Was it you no, know, but it was important enough to say I've been to university. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't um, he failed the degree. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. But that but that obviously had a status for him. It made him feel um successful because he'd been to university. So he needed to tell you that. But he also I, I suppose he could have not could have blagged it and not said failed at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The next. <laughs> Well, I mean, what are the, is just summing things up now, I mean, if people can push themselves for success so much that it, that it breaks them, that it, you know, it ruins them financially or they lose their home and their marriage, that kind of thing. <laughs> How, when you're working with people that maybe you've gone through something as traumatic as that, do you try and nudge them down a route where they have a more a simpler life, where they kind of value simpler things and, 
you know, they can wake up and just the fact that the sun is shining is enough for them? Or, or, or to those kind of people, do they have to always be striving for more things? But one of the things that, that's very relevant um, when you're working with people that are in the success game is when they don't succeed, they see themselves as a failure. Um, and I was working recently with somebody who had been through that kind of experience and they described themselves as being a complete loser. And, and I said, okay, let's turn that round. Let's say you're not a loser. Let's say you're a learner. You're a complete learner because that's what you're getting out of this. You're learning lessons and you're learning and you're growing and you're developing. Um, and we had a long conversation around it, but it managed to change the way that they were approaching their next step because it was, okay, what can I learn from this so that maybe I could create the success that I want? I don't know. Um, but I, I think that that whole idea of, if I am invested emotionally in my property, my money, my status, my position, if I lose that, then I'm a nobody. If it goes away, I'm, I'm nothing, am I? Because that's what I've, I've given myself the value of being. Yeah. Mm. Um, it, if, if success is what I see it to be, because we have neuroplasticity, we can change that. We can change our relationship with success. Yeah. Because we, we can change the way our brain is functioning. You know. Because one of the things, I, I, and you and I have touched this several times over the last couple of years, but it's like you and I both earn a living doing what we want to do. Yeah. Yeah. So that, to me, that's actually a form of success because you and I don't go to work. What we do is we get up and we do what we do. And it's a part of our, the way that we create our, our living and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we don't go to work. How many people go to work and hate it and then come home and pop a cork anyway so they can survive the stress of it? Yeah, yeah. I know. I've just, I've just put a, a thing on Twitter, actually, on my, my transport uh, obsession. I just remembered this quote. So I think about this one a lot, actually, and it's by, a, I think he was a mayor of a South American country, Gustavo Petro. A developed yeah. country is not a place where the poor have cars. It's where the rich use public transport. So I think about that one a lot because how, how do we get to the point where success in transport terms isn't, isn't a shiny Tesla on your driveway or worse, parked on the road, taking up valuable space? How, how do we get to the point where rich people or wealthy people want to use a bus or a train or a bike? Is that even possible or am I just, am I just like fighting a losing battle? <laughs> Um, I, I think one of the problems is that because of that, that emotional connection to the to the machine, um, and I mean, I'm, I'm sure that, that you can take the car out of society or the personal transport out of society. It will probably take a generation for it to work through, for people to have kind of learned to live without it. But, but I think that's why the electric or the hydrogen vehicle becomes more attractive to people because they, they want to maintain that individual ability to go and do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I guess when you're looking at success, the ability to do what you want to do is usually seen as a point of success. Whereas if, if I can't do what I want to do, then I'm a failure. Yeah, we were on the way to the restaurant last night. We we just set off on our stroll and it's like, it's about half a mile walk along the road, not far. Um, and our neighbor had just, was just heading out on a trip in her car to go and pick the kids up from somewhere, maybe grandparents or somewhere. And um, she stopped and waited quite a long time actually for us to catch up with her uh, and shouted across, do you want a lift? Um, and like, she was obviously, I think she, she thought she was doing us a big favor and she doesn't know that I hate cars. Yeah. <laughs> But for us, like the, the walk was part of the night out, you know, that we can have a chat on the way uh, and, and a catch up. And, you know, she was being really, really nice and obviously didn't know, didn't know that I was analyzing her the whole time. Um, but I think she thought that a walk was a bit of a hardship for us, you know, the, the half a mile thing. And yeah. we would, you know, we, would we were walking because we were gonna have a drink or two perhaps, and that she was mm. doing us a favor. Uh, but yeah, again, fascinated <laughs> by that culture. Yeah. yeah. So, but we, we said yeah. we slightly declined. 
Mm. Yeah, I mean, but overall in this, success is in the eye of the beholder. And, and if you go back to that quote at the beginning, which was the pursuit of achievement distracts from the deeply ordinary activities and relationships that make life meaningful. And that there's something in that. I think that in our drive to do things, be things, and to have things, we lose that, that sense of the meaningfulness of life. We, we lose the connection with it. Mm. And that, again, sorry to go on, man, but that's, that's part of my main drivers about the whole car thing, because I think cars disconnect us from our surroundings yeah. and the people that we live near. And it's really yeah. hard to get that message across. But mm. um, yeah, the, the technology we have, including phones and goodness knows what else, it kind of it distracts us from the kind of life that people might be striving for. So we might be working our backsides off uh, and buying all this stuff so that we can have a really nice, peaceful life in a little village somewhere where we can get to know our neighbors better. Uh, but you know, that life is available to us probably right now, isn't it? Yeah. There, there's a lovely story that I actually used in one of the very first blogs I did, um, which is about a guy who's on a river and he's, he's fishing and he's really good at it and he's catching fish and, and he feeds his family using a rod. And there's a businessman in, in an in a office block opposite and he watches him do it and he, and he said, this guy is so amazing. So one day he, he walks down, goes across the bridge and goes to talk to him. And he says, you know, you're so good at this. Imagine if you had three rods rather than one, you know, how much fish you could catch. And he takes him through this whole story. It's quite, quite a complicated story, but he takes him through the whole story where um, if he had three rods, then maybe he gets one where he could employ a couple of people and they could have three rods each. So suddenly he's gone to this, he's, he's now got a whole kind of network going and he's got shops and he's selling. And, and then he takes him right through to the point where he's got a cannery and he could can fish and send it all over the world. And, and he takes through all these wonderful ideas and he said, and you know what, then you'd be able to do absolutely whatever you wanted to do. You'd be completely free. What would you do? And he said, I'd come down here and fish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like, he was already there. Why would you need to go all the way around the, the houses to come back to the same place? You know? It's good. Yeah, it's a good story that, I mean, you've said it before, but I thought I, I needed a refresh, so... Yeah, I guess we uh, we all need to just take a step back and try and figure out what it is we're actually the end goal. Maybe it's because a lot of people don't know what their end goal is, and they need to. We need to just sit down and do a bit of work on that. And you might realise that to get to actually to get to that end goal, you don't need a big house and a big car and a guaranteed income of X per year. You just need to, yeah, calm things mm -hmm. down a bit and uh, yeah, sell it yeah. all and just enjoy the simple life and buy a fishing rod. You know that idea, the Dickensian idea, really, of um, if you've got, if you need a pound and you've got one pound fifty, then you're rich. <laughs> and, uh, if you need a pound and you've got ninety pence, you're poor. <laughs> yeah, and and it's like if you need a pound, you don't need to have twenty thousand in the bank just in case you need another pound. But that's the way our minds work. Yeah. And there's issues around security there, aren't there? And we kind of wrap ourselves in mortgages and payments and direct debits coming out of our ears, which do kind of box us in a little bit. So, uh, yeah, maybe maybe I'll go and cancel my Netflix um, <laughs> uh, subscription after this and just kind of try and calm it all down a little bit. <laughs> could you live without Netflix? Though? Imagine I could, but yeah, there's other people that use our account that would be they'd be up in arms. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, what's your resource of the week, Sean? My, my resource would be, if you haven't got the Live in the Present book, get it, um, you know, or we'll send you a bit or whatever. But it's like, in there, it's the whole section on gratitude. If you get into the gratitude of who you are, where you are, what you're doing and what you've got, we are all amazingly lucky. We're all amazingly rich. So that thing about even the people that are on benefits in this country are still in the 10% richest people on the planet you know that's amazing but it's real yeah, yeah. and we, we need to get a bit of gratitude going for what we've got mm. so my my resource of the week is develop an attitude of gratitude for everything that's around you grab it yeah beautiful all right cool and mine's a book called status anxiety by 
Alain de Botton, he's a British uh, writer. Yeah. Um, which, yeah, yeah there's, a, there's actually a YouTube video version, a documentary did on it. Um, yeah. It's worth looking at as well. But the book's really fascinating stuff, actually. So have a look at that as well. Yeah. All right, Sean, we'll be back for yeah. more next week. Um, and yeah, you take care. Yeah, keep smiling. See, See you later. Bye. Bye.